Welcome, everybody, once again. It's time for Choice TV Radio Show. The only choice you have to make is, is it radio? Is it TV? Hey, it's both. With your host, John Marchese, award-winning executive producer and owner of Choice TV. Welcome, John. Well, thank you, Paul. And boy, is it both. Because uh, yesterday, I was Ryan and I were in studio all day filming the Choice TV show to put on to air on Fox 11. You shoot it up at Fox, don't you? No, we shoot it down here in Huntington Beach. Oh, okay. we have uh, We have a studio that uh, we use from KVLA uh, Studios. Okay. And uh, Ryan, was, was it a busy day or what? Extremely busy, but I think we got a quality show in the can. And uh, I'm really excited. You know why? Why is that? Because, well, in addition to having Paul, my announcer, Ryan, my producer, I have my wife, Madonna, wow, hey, in the studio go. as well. And uh, maybe Madonna will, will say, yeah, we got clapping. We got lots of clapping. And maybe later on she'll ask a question or two. Um, and I am super excited because... Do we have to I, applaud every time she asks a question? <laughs> Let's do that. Okay. Let's do that for sure, Paul. That's a good, right. that's a good idea. Right. I have my guest... Dr. James Mercer in studio right here. Now that's a clap. We deserve a clap. Hey, James. Hey, how are you? Okay, how are you? I'm great. Uh, James and, and it's and Nita. Nita is here. His friend Nita. Say hi, Nita. Hi, Nita. <laughs> <laughs> now, no, no applause for Nita. Now, now James <laughs> and and Nita are all the way from Texas. Let me introduce James. Let me. His accomplishments are are, are phenomenal. Doctor, doctor, doctor. James Mercer has his doctorate in psychology, and before that, Paul, he was a funeral director and owner. Yikes! So we're going to get lots of lots of stories about that. But now he owns a foster care and adoption agency, which focuses on the thousands of children throughout Texas who have suffered abuse. And there's lots of them, God, God knows. Exactly. Yes, yes. His new book, published by Simon & Schuster, folks, Secrets and Shame, Dear Oprah Diaries, it's a huge success. It's flying off the shelves. And it is an incredible read. And we're going to talk about that, James. Welcome to Choice TV Radio. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh, this is I'm I'm really excited. Uh, I read the book. It's phenomenal. It uh, it's a page turner. It really is. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, and and I actually <laughs> got an autographed copy, folks. So so I'm excited about that. Uh, we'll we'll get into the, uh, your history, but I want to talk about now. You run a a child care and adoption agency, or not child care, a, a foster care. And adopt. Tell me a little bit about Correct. that. Uh, well, it's Lone Star Social Services in Austin, Texas. We focus on the hundreds and thousands of children mm -hmm. that have experienced abuse and neglect at the hands of those who were supposed to have loved them and care. Well, you know, that's not unfair. They do love them. Right. They just made a mistake, and we come in and we help educate and try to get them back to where they need to be so they can take better care of their kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's such a need, right? There, there is. is. There really is. You know, it. Um, it's something I experienced as a child, of course. And now I want to make sure that the children that are facing the exact same issues that I did, we can help them and fix that. Right, right. And let's talk about your path. How? What got you interested? You grew up in Texas, in a little I town did. in Lucky Texas, me. Tumbleweed, Texas, right? Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Tumbleweed, Texas. Is that really the name? Come on. <laughs> yes. That's, that's where we're going to keep it. Yes. Yeah, we're going to keep it in Tumbleweed, Texas, <laughs> folks. Just keep it out in Tumbleweed. Yeah, it, it, All right. It fits. But uh, yeah, James uh, had uh, it, it was a it was a challenging life to say the least right to say the least to for real yeah and uh i mean we can read it all in the book but uh you grow up uh, it was an abusive it was abusive relation uh, oh, it was i yes. mean you, there was verbal abuse physical abuse sexual abuse you name it i mean it was there at school at home um Regardless of where we were, there was abuse, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. James's father, it was, it was, it wasn't. He didn't support you, did he? That it, at all? Yeah, <laughs> at all, at all, at all. But it made you, it made you uh, stronger. It made, and, I mean, it made me me. You know, it really did. Yes, yes. Um, and and hungry, hungry, starving, I mean, poor. Correct. Poor. You know, when I read the book, it was, you know, you hear about uh, people just being hungry or, or these relationships, abusive relationships, but when you actually read it, mm -hmm. it's just the words just, it was it was palpable, just how impactful. I mean, you, you didn't have a, 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 a bed. You slept on the floor. Well, you know, we had, our the bed that we had was so 
you could you could see the springs. So I would get the dirty clothes that we had because we had no washer and dryer. So I'd get the dirty clothes and put them in the springs and try to make a cushion mm-hmm. out of them. At night, I would sneak out to go to the local relative's home into their back door because they always left the back door open. Uh-huh. And I would go in and take spam <laughs> and bread. <laughs> And, and, that, did. and that was like a treat for oh, your, it was because yeah. we had no food had so no food. all day our stomachs would grumble and i would you know i felt like the uh what do you call it the the caregiver or provider for my my mm-hmm. brother so of course i had to um do what i had to do and sneaking out and borrowing food was the way to go Right, yeah. right, and 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 your mom, he not only abused you and your, but your mom. I mean, there was one yeah. po- point that uh, he dislocated her shoulder because she wouldn't pull his teeth out. <laughs> Tell, talk about that. Well, we laugh that. now, but you know, as a kid, when you're watching such viciousness and hate coming from the sky, and you know, he he would have this putrid smell of alcohol and yeah. cigarettes and drunk all the time. So whenever he was on this rampage about, I'm going, I, I need my teeth pulled, my mother was scared to death and she was like, oh, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it, so we're up. Mm-hmm. I would, I would do what if you want me to do it, I will do it. Just leave my mother alone. But as soon as he pulled her arm out of socket, it was put right back in when he shoved her against the wall. And when you hear it and you see it, you cannot shake that visual. I'm 34. This happened when I was a kid, and I still remember it so viv- vividly. Yes, yeah. And you ended up pulling his teeth out with the pliers because did. they didn't it have was insurance. The grossest feeling. Yeah, talk talk about that. Talk so, about that. You know, he he was so adamant about pull my teeth and my mother was scared to death my mom they were know, rotting they were he didn't have insurance they were yes. rotting right? so i am how old are you now p- you're like nine ten you're like <laughs> um back then back then let me see you were young you were i was kid. young very you young so what I, I whenever I, I remembered grabbing the pliers putting them on his yellow stained brownish nicotine mm-hmm. flavored looking teeth gripping them and i remember thinking if I push any harder, it's going to crack them. Mm-hmm. But there was a level of satisfaction I got to pull those <laughs> teeth, you know, because it, 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 it gave him pain. He was in pain with them. Uh-huh. So I did the a mitzvah by pulling them for him, but then it was also joy to get him to chill out for a minute and focus on the bleeding. And blood <laughs> everywhere. Not blood anyone everywhere. Else. Yeah. I love, there was a quote in the book. It, you, you said, uh, um, that dentistry was never on my list of possible th- uh, careers that night. <laughs> check. Check. Yeah, yeah. You, you weren't going to be a dentist. I won't do it again. You weren't, you weren't <laughs> going to be a dentist. Um, and, uh, you know, you didn't have a lot of support at, at school either. You were right. abused at, at home. And, and not that we want to, you know, talk, uh, you know, it, but it is, it is part of you. It is part well, of your story, that the abuse. It and brought me, you know, when you're being, a, when you're raised I, my vision of being a parent is totally different. I think that whenever you're a parent, you you're, you should be so blessed to have this kid that God allowed yes. you to even have. Right. And you should worship them and love them and take care of them. And then whenever you void, for, you void that and you do what Harry did mm-hmm. in the book, you know, it kind of he, – he taught me a lot. You know, he taught me what not to do as a parent, and I would write Oprah and let her know what not to do and remind me, Oprah, whenever I am older and I do have kids, what not to do. Yeah, and I love that in the book. You, you start, Oprah was like your, your hero. She, you wrote letters to Oprah. Well, you know, my, growing up in a racist home, my dad was so big on no Hispanics, no blacks, no Asians, no white, no nothing. I mean, you couldn't be anything other than what he deemed appropriate. So whenever I would listen to him i didn't believe it because i would see oprah and she would explain about all of the struggles she's gone through and even though she was speaking to millions of people Mm -hmm. every day she was just talking to me Mm. and i would listen to her and write those oprah letters and when he found them he burnt them up with a big lighter the orange bic and he was so mad that i i don't know if he was mad because i was talking to her about my gay tendencies or the gay thoughts or that he was abusive and an alcoholic or what my mom was going through Mm -hmm. or if it was because she was black honestly you know because she he didn't like that Mm -hmm. but oprah was and you know i'm Mm -hmm. sidetracked here but you know having gone to church all the time as a kid you're told to believe in god you're told Mm -hmm. to understand god and god's perfect and doesn't make mistakes but then everyone's telling me james you're flawed Mm -hmm. you're imperfect 
apparently God messed up. So Oprah was more like the God that I could see and mm-hmm. believe and truly. And I know the comparison's off, but you know it is. But to you, she was. Yeah, she was. She, she, she was, understood she was what my... you were going through. Correct. Because you didn't feel like God was. I mean, you're being abused mm-hmm. at home and at school. And I mean, there's a chapter or a, a part that uh, you know just a horror or horrific thing happened uh, mm-hmm. to James with the with the truck, and, and it just it's horrible with the kind of abuse. Um, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I want the ladies and gentlemen to, to listen. That you didn't even want to run away because you were worried about your brothers. I'm you glad you the, picked that. Of uh, course, it, it, because I felt a sense of I had to take care of them. You know, my the dad. You you picture this strong man that's going to take care of your family and protect you, and he couldn't. He was so addicted to the substance that he couldn't focus on how to be a real dad. So, you know, even though as a kid I I hated him mm-hmm. for it, as an adult I don't hate him anymore. I feel sorry for him because he missed out on parenting and he missed out on so much. And, you know, I it, it hurts to see that he missed out. And so I do feel bad for him. Yeah, yeah, obviously. But I did have to take care of my brothers. I had to make sure they ate. Mm-hmm. I had to make sure um, my mom would eat. So whenever I'd sneak out to go get spam and bread, mm-hmm. I would, no matter how hungry I was and wanted to just gorge, I wouldn't. I would have to give it to them first, and then I would take whatever was left. And there's days to where I remember just being so hungry, thinking, this is not good yeah well you wrote in your book about god does give you the when you're that hungry the it lessens and i don't mm-hmm. i have never been that hungry thankfully <laughs> but right that you just I don't, don't recommend feel. it yeah right it's very overrated being hungry absolutely like that but you also after so much so i mean this is how hungry james was that you don't feel the hunger anymore it lessens it right? becomes void it really does and you know d- it, it, The hunger from food and the hunger from belonging and being accepted, Mm. all of that combined, you just get, you just void it all out, you know, and you just, you live, you learn to live life minute by minute Mm -hmm. in that situation. Mm -hmm. Today, I am so thankful I don't have to live life minute by minute. I plan for the future. 20 years from now, I've got plans, so, you know, but during that moment, it was just minute by minute how to get him how to get my dad distracted or how to get food or how to get someone at school to chill out for a minute chill out yeah it's not easy being gay in texas it's a long time ago right a long time ago very true you know and it's yes. still not easy being gay today mm-hmm. in 2016 working with the children that we work with there's so many kids that feel secluded and left out and it hurts me because it is 2016 and we should be more supportive and understanding that God doesn't make a mistake. You are, you're gay, you're straight, you're not, you don't decide to wake up one day and be gay, and I tell people that all the time. I, if I could have changed being gay, I would have found a beautiful woman Mm -hmm. and had babies and did the whole... It would have been easier for you. Plaid shirt, greased down, slicked hair, and had perfect Christmas pictures, or Hanukkah pictures, (laughs) whichever, would celebrate both. Sure, sure. But that wasn't. It wasn't. It, it, it wasn't, wasn't you. This is. No. This is you. In fact, it was a. I gotta put my glasses on here. Um, you went to church, and they said they didn't advocate going to Disney World because they let the gays in. And you had a quote, Mr. You really, Bowles, good old Mr. Bowles. Let's listen. Yeah, from your from your Christian school, correct? Mr. Yeah. Bowles said you can't go to Disney World because they let the gays in. And you wrote, you couldn't decide if you wanted to be gay or go to Disney World. <laughs> You had to pick a choice. Am I gay or am I going to go to Disney World? Correct. I mean, that's so, it's so, it's beautiful and childlike, but it's hard whenever you're a kid and you're being told by powerful people that, Mm -hmm. you know, Mr. Bowles, the Sunday school teacher was powerful. You know, the the pictures of the fiery pits of hell on his wall and how every homosexual is going. And Mm -hmm. I knew I was homosexual and I knew I was going. Mm -hmm. So I was always trying to find a way to get out of it. So I thought if I wrote Oprah another letter tonight, yes. Oprah can talk to the big God and fix it all. And in his in his book, Secrets and Shame, Dear Oprah Diaries, it includes Oprah your letters to Correct. Oprah. And there's just so it's I could see she was like your savior. It was she was you know, I, I tell everybody this and I, I will repeat myself forever. She was the 
I couldn't trust anyone because mm-hmm. if I told you, hey, John, my dad's an alcoholic and he's probably on drugs tonight and going to jerk my mom around a few times, you would have probably reported it. So if I told you, I knew that there was a chance that I would have to leave my home. And even though it was turmoil for so many of us that understand what stable mm-hmm. life is, it was my normal. So when you have outside factors telling you that you're, it's not normal for you to live this way, it's very conflicting mm-hmm. for a young kid to understand, well, what's normal, what's not normal? Are you gay? Are you not gay? How do I quit being this way? So it was... And, and, and Harry, uh, this stands out to me, he burned all of your pictures, all of your uh, your uh, notes, letters to Oprah, everything. Right. The only picture, and I just realized this the other day, the only picture that survived, folks, is the picture, you're probably in, what, second, third grade? It's on the cover of his, of his book. But here's yeah. this thing I didn't notice. Your eye is black and blue. It is. In yeah. this. In I this fell. picture. Yeah, you, you quote unquote <laughs> fell. I fell. You I tripped fell. a lot. Yeah, and 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 here's the thing I find quite sad. Oprah never answered the letters. But see, you know, I don't even think of that as being sad, because as a kid, I couldn't trust anyone to keep my secret, because I knew, and I would coerce my brothers, do not tell anyone how your arms broke or your legs broke or your don't tell them because they're going to take us away and who's going to protect my mom. So I kept him, I kept my brothers on a very tight leash with that. But I don't look at it as sad that Oprah didn't respond because mm-hmm. she was the she taught me that I can trust someone. She's never disclosed my secrets, never told anybody what was going on at the Mercer residence. Yes. And for that, I'm forever grateful. She can continue shopping for Stedman and Uta because I'm okay. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> we fixed it. Right. And, but you'd love to meet her. Oh, hun- oh, <laughs> listen, for real. So if anybody out there, back. if anybody out there has a connection to Oprah, James Mercer, call me. Is we'll go her shopping. Number one fan, and you could dress her too, right? You're good and with clean fashion. Her toilets. And okay, yes, I spent I, my life cleaning. We got to talk about that. That's interesting. That was like uh, that was your escape. You love to clean, especially the bathroom. Just well, tell, let me tell, tell the you, audience when about you, that. When you are born different, you don't feel accepted. You don't feel important. So. I needed to do something to distract me, so I wanted to make my mother smile. My mom has a beautiful smile, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can't see it often because, you know, dad would jostle her around a little bit. So anything I could do to make her smile. So I remember they would get drunk. Him and his friends would get drunk, pee on the toilet, pee on the floor. Throw up everywhere. Throw up everywhere. So in order to make her smile and not her not have to do it, I would clean it myself. And I remember her smiling the biggest smile, and I would always tell Oprah, I'm going to catch a flight to Chicago. Uh-huh. Do you, I'm getting emotional you here. Are, you but, are. you know, I'm like, I will catch a flight to Chicago, and I'm going to make you smile, too, Oprah. Because prior to the day I wrote that, she was explaining how she dealt with so much. And I, I remember looking at her thinking, she's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I don't know why would someone why someone would be so hateful to Oprah. Mm-hmm. And then throughout the years of, quote-unquote, knowing Oprah, she would um, talk about her weight gain issues Mm -hmm. and i just want to tell her girl you're beautiful embrace yourself here now read dr robbie ludwig's book right best ages now that's going to help you exactly so she was going through struggles too even if you're oprah no matter who you you are we're we're facing struggles and we have to siphon what's our burden and what's not and that's why i created secrets and shame Mm -hmm. i carried around all these secrets and i had all this immense amount of shame and it never belonged to me and i finally decided thanks to one of my girlfriends linda linda Linda. in dallas okay not betsy betsy's always there okay we we gotta give a shout out to betsy we love you yeah we love betsy we love but what about linda linda said you have to tell your story and i was in my closet ironically i'm always in my closet talking to people if Uh i'm on the phone with you at night i'm Uh probably in my closet Uh talking to you Uh so linda said it really is it always has been from school to as a kid but linda said you have to tell your story you have such a beautiful outlook on something so terrible and i said well the shame isn't mine 
And that's whenever we decided to release it mm -hmm. and let it out. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of embarrassment with this. I will tell you, you talk about being molested as a kid and, you know, 34 years old today. Yeah. And I still feel dirty. Yeah. Can't take enough showers. You yeah. can't count enough tile ceiling tiles. You can't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's difficult. So I want other people that read this to know you're not alone. And don't be defined by someone who says you're something. That's their perception. And that's mm -hmm. okay. They can think what they want. And before we go to the break, yeah, I do want to mention that um, because, um, yeah, you then you became a funeral director. You went to funeral school, but there was an uncle that, uh, yeah, he was not good right. to you. Yeah, right. the molestation. Mm -hmm. But you ended up, you were, you took, right? I he did. Was one of the bodies <laughs> that did. you took care of. And I just want I to did. mention um, just that before we go on the break. You became, you went to funeral school. I did. I started off at 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, walking home from school, and I would always see this plump man standing, uh, smoking his pipe, and I just remembered, you know he's eating, because he has weight on him, mm -hmm. and he's, he wasn't like attractive, like sexual attractive, but he was attractive in the sense of successful, mm -hmm. and his wife was gorgeous, and you know, I just wanted to be them. And I wanted whatever it was I wanted to do. I had no clue what being a funeral director meant. I just knew whatever he's doing, I have to have a part of that. And I did. And you, and yeah, even though you didn't, you dropped out of high school, you dropped you, out, obtained yeah. a GED. Yes, you got a thanks GED. Thanks to my girlfriends, Betsy and Butch. Uh -huh, Butch, I know, I want to <laughs> talk about Butch. Butch, Butch, Ryan, Butch, chew, uh, a gal, she chews tobacco. Chews tobacco and wears ace bandage around her boobs. Uh -huh. <laughs> to make her look more masculine. And we would always fantasize, do you think maybe God did make a mistake? And she'd be like, well, I don't know about all that. You know, and she'd just get real masculine uh -huh. and butchy. And I would tell her, well, if I were a girl and you were a boy, we'd be perfect. Right. But she'd always be like, but then we wouldn't be herself as she would spit her chewing tobacco in her cup. Oh, my God. Well, we got to give a shout out to, you think Betsy's listening and, and Butch? We got to give a shout out to them. We really do. Okay. We love them. All right. All right. <laughs> Well, when we come back, we're going to talk more about the f funeral direct, being a funeral director. Stuff, yeah. Oh, my God. That's a lot of stories. And uh, so stay tuned, and we will be right back in two minutes. Wow. Let's get back to this powerful story. Everybody's choked. Everybody's so quiet in the room here, except when you told a couple of those stories there. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, John Marchese, Choice TV Radio. I'm joined with my guest, Dr. James Mercer. He is promoting his incredible book secrets and shame dear oprah diaries and uh as last we left off you you met mr pastore right correct yeah pastor pastore italian nice italian uh guy and, and, and his wife and he was a funeral director and owner and you're like he has a he has weight i'm starving it looks interesting i'm gonna be i'm gonna you you asked him for a job i did and you started well, let me it. tell you i yes. i tell everybody my Everybody that I meet in life, we're, there's so many storms in life, but there's very few rainbows. And w what I mean by that is we, good people like yourself, John, mm -hmm. you were a rainbow in my life. You came into my life and you've just been an outstanding friend and a great person. So you're Aww. another one of them vibrant colors of the rainbow. Thank my, you. Yeah. Thank you. But you know, I there was a huge storm and we had walk home all the time and I always had um, jogging pants with shoelaces tied around my waist and flopping soles and my I, my clothes stunk and I would always get picked on about it but I remembered I need to take shelter underneath this awning and I took shelter and Mr. Pastore came out and I said oh I'm so and I, if you if you hear me now I'll still say I'm sorry all the time for anything I'm always like mm -hmm. oh I'm sorry mm -hmm. because I always felt like I'm doing something wrong so those that those two words I still can't shake unfortunately mm -hmm. so I said oh I'm sorry and he said no come on in his wife put the fluffiest white mm. towel around me and that should be something that so many people take that for granted but when Growing up, my towels, you could see through them, and they would scratch your back as you were, wa you know, drying, trying to dry off without ripping them. Mm -hmm. And so, went in, and, you know, I was very vulnerable and asked him, you know, whatever I can do, I'll do it for free. And I remember asking, my, telling myself, what the hell are you yeah, doing? Right. You don't do anything for free. You're starving and you need money. Yeah. But I knew that if I could show him that I was serious, he, maybe it could help my mom eat. Or get her seizure med you know my mom has seizures so she has to have her seizure medicine i can help her get her medicine and i can get the boys clothes and maybe if i wear nice clothes people at school will 
think I'm prettier. And so you got a job. I gave got you a, a job. job. I mowed grass for a year and a half almost. And I was so mad one day because I was sweating. My pants were falling off of me. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I quit. And he started laughing. And I'm like, you uh -huh. think everything's funny. Uh -huh. It's not funny. Right. I quit. Right. Anyways, he, he what happened? gave me a job <coughs> in the now. embalming room for the first time. He said, are you sure you're ready? And I said, I promise you I'm ready. I got to do makeup and hair and fingernails. And when the family came in to see their loved one, they were so moved by how beautiful I had made their mother. Yes, yes. And that's when it connected. This is how I'm going to get respect. Right. I'm going to take care of the deceased, and I'm going to give them the most fabulous send-off ever. And people are going to love me. And I'm going to go down in history for being the most fabulous uh, funeral director. And I did. Yes. I feel. You even impressed Mr. Pastore. Oh, I he did. He walked in on, on, one of the, on one of the bodies, and it was like it was it was amazing the work that you that you did. He could not believe I could do hair <laughs> that well and the makeup, you know. And it, he was just so impressed. So over the time, John, yes. he taught me yeah. how to embalm. Mm -hmm. The first time I was scared to death. I remember him making an incision into mm -hmm. the neck by the carotid area, right above the clavicle. And I remember being scared to death, thinking, what is this guy doing? And he was so nonchalant about it. And I'm shaking, trying not to show him how afraid I was because I needed. Mr. Pastore always said, I'm proud of you, son. Good job, son. Mm -hmm. And even those, those words... Mm -hmm rolled off his lips like yesterday's newspaper. Right. It and was, you never got that before. I didn't get it. it was so like I right. strived to continue doing better so he could tell me again how much he cared. He was like it your surrogate dad. Through. He was your surrogate dad. I mean, you know, he was like your father figure, right? Or no? A lot like a father. Actually, I, I, as a kid, I would always wish... And, you know, I would pray to Oprah and pray to God and so forth. You know, God, if you are real and Oprah, I know you're hearing me, make sure <laughs> you can get Mr. Bastori and my mom together. Not that I wanted to be a homewrecker. I just wanted him to be a dad all the time. Mm. No homewrecking. Mm -hmm. And so you became, uh, you did embalming and you were good at it. You were good. You mixed the chemicals and he was I impressed with that. Yeah. Well, you, you know, there's a chemistry by it, behind sure. it. So a lot of people are like, you know. I didn't know there was a school to be a funeral director. You have to get a degree, actually. You have to. You learn have to be how licensed. To, you have to be licensed. Yes. It's difficult. Yes. Yes. The most difficult school ever. And you rearranged his whole uh, his whole embalming room. Yeah, it was it spotless. Was it was spotless. He he moaned and groaned because he couldn't find some of his instruments, but but it was I all organized. Them. It was perfect. So how did it feel, James? Uh, and and this is great because you're right here. Uh, you had the uncle that abused you. Right. He sat. He was la laid <laughs> mm -hmm. on your table. How? What was that moment like? You know that I I had a lot of mixed. As a funeral director, we take an oath under whatever circumstance you you treat everybody with dignity, whether it's the president of the United States or the janitor. Mm -hmm. And I still live my life, and I teach my kids that today. You treat everyone good. You don't know what people are going through, mm -hmm. but whenever I seen my uncle on the table, it's kind of like you're empty because of what he did and you bear that secret that you didn't want to tell anyone else because you don't want them to be upset thinking it's, everything was my fault. So if I disclosed that he touched me inappropriately, it would have been somehow my fault. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't, I just figured I had enough drama, enough issues already. Um, whenever you're a kid and you're thinking about suicide all the time, it's not... You don't need to add something else to your plate. So I did, I did not disclose mm -hmm. um, to anyone. But whenever I did see him on the table, I there was a sense of you get what you deserve. Right. But then there was the that was the evil side of me. Yeah. Because the pure side is it's so sad that you you made poor decisions, but I forgive you. <sighs> and I would think about you know accidentally drop him. You do kick him, hit him, punch right. him, slap him, do something to show how mad. But, but you know what? Even though some people think that God made a defective gay kid, he did really good. Mm. And my mama did good. Because despite all the turmoil, I was able to still rise above and choose the high life. Choose what's right. Mm -hmm. And 
I could have, you know, I could have been ill and rude, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't. You didn't? No. You didn't. I, I treated him with the utmost respect. Um, Mr. Pastore said, if you cannot embalm him, I understand. And I said, no, sir, I will not let you down. Uh -huh. and, and I didn't. Did. I saved him you did. from having to do it himself. And when we were done, he looked fabulous. Right. And I was proud of myself for taking that road. Right. And it's cathartic. It was. It, it is. Was, you yeah, know, you still have. You, you can have those negative thoughts. Right. Just don't follow through. Void them out. Have them and let it go. We're yeah. human. Yeah. And I want just to lighten it up a little bit. Funeral stories. I hear that the bodies, they moan when you put them. I, I would well, be scared know, you... out of my mind, <laughs> Nita. Wouldn't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they do, and their harm sometimes flops out. I mean, just well, they move on their own. Well, let me tell you. Okay, well, let's this talk is about what that. happens. So when you're aspirating a person, which it, there's a long trocar type metal instrument that you insert in the abdomen right three inches above the umbilical right. cord three inches to the right, right. You know, that type of, and you're up and you're doing your thing um back and forth motion they will gargle oh. and it is well you know when I, yeah today I, I sleep in the same room it doesn't bother me but right. as when you're 14 and 15 you yeah, yeah, it's pretty scary. I've heard now, and this is a wives' tale that they 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 could sit up, that they sit up or they move. Their arms will move. They get rigor mortis. Does that happen? Come on, James. no, 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 no. They don't sit up. They don't sit up. They do not sit up. <laughs> no, I have not. Seen I have that heard yet. they sit up, Ryan. Have you heard that? You're into the scary <laughs> stuff. Have you heard that? Yeah, I, I've heard of uh, like muscle contraction. Like you'll see like oh, fingers, but they do like, have. They, yeah, they have muscle contractions okay. depending on how long they've died, and you you can see a finger move every once okay. a, a twitch, not really a move, I should say. But that's huge, Nita. That's huge. That's huge. A dead body that's twitching. Well, listen, I used to make poor Nita go with us to make removals at the medical examiner, and I told her, I said, before we pull up, girl, I gotta let you know, uh -huh. it's it's gonna smell. Uh-huh. And she said, oh, no, we're good, I got it. <laughs> did she, she say it like it. that? How did you say it? <laughs> okay, we're oh, good. Oh, no, we're good. We, <laughs> we got it. it. <laughs> we got this. <laughs> Trembling in my boots. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Much like the 13-year-old James doing it, you know, but after you're around it so long, you're like, come on, girl, let's go. Another one. Right. We gotta so, help him. So Another family we get to be blessed with. Any, <laughs> like, because I'm putting you on the spot what else any other thing in that people would find interesting that's happened well let me tell you something um the the fatty deposits in our body yeah um look a lot like corn on the cob so it's hard to eat corn. <laughs> it's right. hard to eat corn your carotid artery feels like a rubber band you know when you go to the, yeah. the, the walmart or hgb or something well y'all don't have that here do y'all we have walmart so texas we have walmart. Okay, they're everywhere uh-huh I'm, I'm from texas i love walmart i really do <laughs> so when you go to walmart yeah. or a grocery store whole foods whatever and you get the broccoli with that blue rubber band yeah. on it that's what your carotid feels oh like so gosh. that's a fun fact oh my gosh Prior to doing uh, directing, producing, I used to practice physical therapy, and uh, we had cadavers in school. We had to learn anatomy, and we had cadaver a year. We spent with the cadavers, and but they're already skinned, and it's not it's yeah. not like they're real. This is real. Well, people. let me tell you, in mortuary school, I was at in Dallas, Texas, and attending a mortuary college there, and was at the Willed Body Program. In the Willed Body Program, uh -huh. as you know, or many of you know, it's donating your body to science. Mm -hmm. And so, as a funeral director, you're taught you be very careful with that body and don't don't make a mark, a cut, an extra cut, or a longer incision, whatever the case is. So whenever I was at the Willed Body Program and they're saying, the left arm's going to this area and the mm -hmm. head's going to this area, it was some pretty intimidating stuff even as a funeral director who's done it for a while wow yes right kind of right. it's it's it seems wrong but then you know it's right because you're helping so, so you're going to save so many lives yes. you're going to give the eye doctor's going to have the eyes and they're going to work and they're going to learn and it was pretty intense sure yeah. And, and not only, and I read in the book, not only did you perform incredible work on the bodies, but you helped people breathe. I breathe. did. I did. Yes. Absolutely. Tell me about well, that. Well, you know, I mean, I, there's so many funeral homes even now today that once you once you make that deposit and you pay them, uh -huh. they're done. We'll see you next time your loved one passes away. And I find that disgusting, honestly. And it's embarrassing to say that as a, a person in the profession. But it's embarrassing. You right. don't 
the services shouldn't end. We have to be there and we have to promote and help them. Uh, uh, where am I at? Let yeah. me see. Yeah. They're looking to you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, you're in uh, Orange County right now. We're in Orange oh, County. Because he's been on a big promotional <laughs> tour, flying to all these cities. In fact, today he flies on a plane, James. Tonight. To, to tonight, to Phoenix. Tonight, tonight to Phoenix. And you've been in Florida. After we end up, we're going to West Hollywood after this. Okay. You're gonna you're gonna hang out in West Hollywood. You'll we love are. it. F- yeah. In fact, he was on set at the Choice TV, and it he met fabulous. Tony Cabrera in and love and Paul Diaz. Yeah, in double love. Okay, you're the They're, biggest fan, right? I really am. <laughs> move out, LA. <laughs> um, but you help people breathe, and you owned a funeral home, and that's where you met your partner, right? You met we your partner. We were in mortuary school. Your mortuary and he kept school. Kept asking me out. And I told Betsy before I left, she said, now don't go off getting with some guy and falling in love because I fell in love. I was such an easy date back Mm, then. mm -hmm. I would let you buy me a hamburger from Burger King and I'd already be your husband. I was planning a life together. And Betsy said, when you go to Dallas, do not do it. And I said, girl, I'm not. I promise you, I will not do it. And Jason came... Jason Asa, his uh-huh. middle name's Jason. Um, anyways, so he came around and he kept asking me out on a date, and I'm like, not interested. Uh-huh. Anyways, he kept going and going and going. So finally, I was like, forget it. I, one damn date, leave me alone. I'm over right. it. Right, right. And I did. And I told him, you know, because I wanted to be petite and pretty. So I was like, oh, I, I'm into salads. Mm-hmm. I was not into salads. I, I wanted a hamburger. You're a hungry. Bacon cheeseburger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm starving. I st- had a lot of time to make up for. So he took me to Garden Inn, which in Dallas, Texas, is not a, a, <laughs> a salad place. It was a Chinese restaurant. Yes. Well, you Harry, never had Chinese Harry food. said Chinese food food will make you sick any kind of food other than pinto beans will make you sick so i was scared to death to try it Mm -hmm. but you know he was paying and i might as well and um when we were done i remember driving back to the mortuary school to the back of the building and he was like can i get a kiss and i'm just like who the hell asked for a kiss on the first date this guy i'm so over him and i'm done and then my nosy aunt got involved later yes and now you're married to and now asa we're married and have how you have three we have three kids you have three we have kids. a 10 year old linden who is the sweetest thing in the world she wants to be a rabbi uh-huh we have a 15 year old Aaliyah who wants to be a chemist one minute and then a a surgeon, a plastic surgeon, the mm, next minute, mm-hmm. which I'm rooting for because I need some work done. <laughs> oh, and Nita, then what do you, th- oh. <laughs> you do not. And then uh-huh. my 18 year old's in nursing school. I just have to keep her there and away from the boys. <laughs> yeah, good luck. I am not a fan of the boys. Good luck. Good luck. I've seen pictures. Gorgeous. Thank you. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. So you owned a few funeral homes. I, I did. mean, you were doing, uh-huh. but you still had a calling to to for I fought. Did. I want to well, talk you know, about that. It the funeral industry. It, it, when you're a funeral director, you're a funeral director for life. It's in your blood. Sure. It's who you are. I still, you know, Nita and I will be driving down the road or catching a flight to the next place, and I will tell her, you know, I really w- this weekend, if we're not busy, I'm going to go to the funeral home and help out, and I'm mm-hmm. going to do a few embalmings or cremations or whatever I need mm-hmm. to do. But, um, yeah, so we did it. But where I'm at now with Lone Star Social Services, focusing on fostering connections and adoptions and foster care, that's there's no great it's not a job it's really not i'm the lucky one mm-hmm. so blessed to be able to do it mm-hmm. that's your that's it's your passion because you grew up though i did yeah you can relate you go into these homes and there's emergency tell the listeners about that you're called on an emergency you got to get we a child children. wherever we wherever i'm at no matter what i'm doing sleeping hungry tired whatever the case is mm-hmm. when i get a call from the child protective services saying we have a child in the hospital with no one, no parents to be there for them. I'm there. Mm. And so, you know, and having a relationship, it does get difficult whenever you're constantly gone or you're at your office till four o'clock in the morning typing paperwork mm-hmm. and you get a phone call saying, are you ever coming home? Mm. But I forgot it was four o'clock in the morning because I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I have another kid Right, to help. right, right. And you are, uh, we're friends. Uh, that's how we met on Facebook, uh-huh. on Facebook. And I Lule. see James. Luli. Ludley? Luli Lumbrock. Luli. Yeah, she's oh, the yeah. one that got... Luli was our, was our connect. Uh-huh. Luli. She's a realtor. A, she a, is. Yes. Gorgeous. Yes, yes. She, 
And uh, I see James up. It's like one in the morning because I'm I'm up late. One in the morning, you know, California. It must be. It's like three, three in the morning. Correct. And he's still up. He's still up. Working time. And I'm I am. Hey James, how you doing? Good, good. In fact, James, it was so funny when he started the the press tour. He he asked me, should I get HD makeup? Should I get makeup? I'm like James, you don't need makeup. Yes, I've been told I need makeup. <laughs> and you bought make. It's expensive, right? Anything in I production is expensive. Well, but you know, Aviva Drescher. Yes, we're. Yes, let's Bravo's talk about a Real Housewife of New York, ex Bravo's Real Housewife of New York. She's an absolutely amazing woman, stunning. I called her and I said, Aviva, what do I do? Uh-huh. Because you said, no, you don't need it. But guys aren't as put together as women. So I called the woman and uh-huh. said, Aviva, what do I do? And she said, oh, honey, you have to go here and get this. And I did. And she was right. <laughs> I have people complimenting my skin all the time. And I'm just like, at Aviva Drescher. Aviva Drescher. She told me. Aviva, Aviva Drescher. And at, when you were out here, who did? tell the audience who you saw yesterday. Oh, well, you know, we go way back. Um, <laughs> Eileen Davidson. The Real Housewives the of Real Beverly Hills. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And Hill. CBS's Young, Young and, the and the Restless. She's been on. Since 82. Since 82. Tell. And she looks like she's 20 years old. She's yes. gorgeous. She is gorgeous. Stunning is woman. Gorgeous. Talented. And you know, there's there's that perception of Hollywood movie stars. Right. That growing up in a small Texas town, it's one of those things you'll never see, you'll never touch or experience. And when you get to talk to these amazing women on the phone, having a normal conversation about weather or kids, mm-hmm. or it's the most amazing thing in the world. And they are such huge advocates for me. And not only for myself, but Secrets and Shame, Dear Oprah Diaries, as well as my agency. Mm-hmm. You know, we have a nonprofit, Lone Star Fostering Connections, and they are so helpful. And what I admire about both Eileen Davidson and Aviva Drescher, and the countless others that I've listed, mm-hmm. you know, as endorsements on my book, they all have a beautiful heart, and they're all willing to use their platform to make a difference. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, Eileen has a quote at the top of your book in the back cover. She does. She does. She endorsed your book. Yeah. And, and you've made Ashley con- Abbott on the real uh, on the uh, Young and the Restless. Uh huh. Stunning. And let me tell you, we we I got to sit on the set with them yesterday. Uh huh. And watching it, it was the most surreal thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Seeing how amazing uh, they're talented. Mm-hmm. They all deserve more money. It's a lot of work. They do. It's a lot of work. Doing I was production. so disappointed in one thing, though, and I do have to say it. What? I was hope there was such a, a good-looking man on that Young and the Restless, and I was hoping Eileen would have kissed him, but it was not her part, and I don't want to <laughs> direct it. But if I could have directed it, I sure would have had them kissing. <laughs> Paul, do you have any questions? Now, Paul has has. I mean, this is just. Amazing. This is absolutely an enchanting, amazing, jaw-dropping story that you've woven here this afternoon. And uh, it touches my heart because, as I mentioned to you off, uh, off mic here, that uh, we adopted uh, a girl out of foster care at 10. And uh, just talk a little bit about the foster care system and the need for parents. It, it's, it's my understanding that roughly there's about a half a million kids in foster care right. at any given moment, half of whom will never go home to anybody. And you know, and it's it's so true, and it's so sad. It, it it really breaks my heart. So when I hear people tell me, "Quit working so much," there's no such thing. I, there's not enough of me. There's not enough of anyone in the world to help with this underreported crisis. It it kills me to see these kids. The kids didn't ask to be here. They didn't ask to be born. Mm-hmm. They didn't ask for the situation they're placed in. But it is up to us, each of us, if we don't stand up and help them you know if we all do what we normally do oh that's somebody else will do it it's never going to happen and that's why we have this crisis so i i beg people to you know you know whether it's my nonprofit or anyone else's nonprofit reach out and help them do something to make a difference become a foster parent you know that's the most that's what we need the most we need more parents who can mm-hmm. help mm-hmm. make and, a difference and one of the things that i discovered is yes all these kids have problems they've all got challenges to overcome well, they wouldn't listen, be in foster would it, care li- wouldn't yeah. you my friend exactly it's so heartbreaking but the amazing thing is they're fixable 
you know, you can make a difference. You 100%. can help them no matter how traumatic, no matter how difficult. These kids are resilient. Absolutely. And uh, unfortunately, as we just we did, uh, adopted somebody who was 10, our daughter was 10 at the time. Most of these kids, after they uh, won two years of age, nobody wants them. They're damaged goods. And so it's uh, that message that don't just look for the little babies that haven't been traumatized or have just been abandoned. You know, jump in there. There's guidance. There's help. We went through lots of classes and stuff to deal with some of these issues. And it's an amazing, amazing journey. I am so glad you said that because, mm -hmm. you know, we do get that label that we're damaged. And we just need that one Mr. Pastore, mm -hmm. that one Eileen Davidson or Aviva Drescher, that one butch or betsy mm -hmm. to show you love and to make you feel important i'm 34 today and a lot of people tell me just be yourself you're so charming you're so funny you're so i i don't know who i am really you know i don't you 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 can't be yourself when you don't know exactly who you are so i tell people all the time be be good to people help the kids focus on them and try to make a difference and that's what you're doing with this book because the proceeds go to help the children i want the listeners have to know that this is amazing James. thank you for mentioning that yes there the portion of the proceeds that we get do get to go to uh, foster care and to make a difference uh-huh uh-huh wow what do you think of that nita Oh, it's just such a blessing to be a part of it. I just love every day uh, the, mm -hmm. the saying that you'll never have a job if you do what you love, and that's where we are. Somebody tweeted in, who's Nita? Right, we, Nita's sort of the sidekick, Nita the is, silent uh, sidekick uh, sitting here. Nita is another Mr. Pastore. Nita tells me where to go, when to be there, how to get there, and hurry up and catch your flight, James. You have enough makeup on, James. And put your, <laughs> no more Starbucks. You're wired enough. But I you met her when? How you. did you just quickly? How did you meet her? How did she Nita, come into your tell life? the story. You do it beautifully. Okay. In 2002, they were fresh out of mortuary school and uh, drove up in front of our house. We had a subdivision, and they were needing a, a home. And <clears throat> they walked in. They had a, a discussion in the car outside about whether to say they were partners or whether they were uh, roommates. just roommates because it was very difficult for getting started with a new job and all that to, to be able to support themselves. And so they walked in the door, and I had just received a package from UPS that was laying on the drawing table in the office of my son and his partner. And... Uh, so it, here they were afraid that somehow this would turn you off if, right. they, if they admitted Right. Well, their that. history had been a couple of times they had not been able that to rent rent a house, and that was the norm mm -hmm. back then. In 2002, we've since then we've come a long way. Yeah. But uh, I decided a long time ago there was a lot after having had a gay son, and uh, that we can be a part of people's lives, or we can be. Uh, pushed out of their lives and Very I made true. the choice that uh, I wanted to be a part of his life and uh, what's ironic about this is I have two children mm -hmm. one is the older one is gay and the younger one looks just like Asa oh my gosh and James's he, partner and this is so amazing that so many people tell me how much he looks like my son Todd Todd yeah. Todd Pierce. Oh. And uh, so he looks so much like my son. So these are my kids. Yes. And the children, when they got the four year old and the two and a half year old, I was taking care of an elderly father and uh, uh, wheelchair bound. And they had these two little girls. And I have two sons and a grandson, and that's it. And the, I wanted to be a grandmother as much as anything and mm -hmm. got to be. And it was, it's, it's still wonderful. I still almost every day hear from my grandson. Oh, my God. Uh, but it was so much fun yes. when the three. Three little girl. Well, it were, there were only two then. Yes. Uh, beca uh, decided to call me. I wasn't a grandma. I wasn't a granny. I just nothing sounded just right. Why don't we call her Grand Nita? And so I'm Grand Nita to those girls. And they oh, paint incredible. her and they paint her toenails blue. And we were on the set of Young and the Restless, <laughs> and Eileen Davidson told her. She, Nita said, my granddaughter painted them. She said, they are on fleek. And I was so proud of Eileen for knowing fleek. That was fabulous. And then I was able to teach Nita a thing or two at 72 years. <laughs> 72 years young. 
<laughs> wow, wow. Isn't so, Ryan? Anything else to add? You've been quiet over there, but this has been so engaging. It has. Um, just on a lighter note. So, did you ever take a nap in a coffin while you were at the? Oh, come on. I did. Come on. I did. I did. I. Yeah, I did. You did. Well, Mr. Pastore played a joke on you, right? He did. I peed all over his floor. <laughs> I was you scared. Did. He I was did. in the I casket. Was scared to death. Right. He was in the casket, right? Correct. And you had to what? Dust it off, and he just popped out. Listen, I was very proud of those caskets. A lot of these car salesmen think they're so special out washing the new Nissan or the new Lexus, while right. I was able to wash the new Batesville casket, the mm -hmm. Cherry, <laughs> or the Presidential. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm wiping off the dust and dust and polishing it, you know, he popped out and you know he enjoyed humor and i loved every bit of it and you it. got his uh, floor dirty i did and yes. i cleaned it right back and you up. cleaned it, was it right fabulous up when i was done right up. well paul is giving me the one minute sign here and so everybody it's on available on amazon barnes We're, and noble barnes and noble bound book uh -huh. people you name it so i want everybody and they're at their computers right now because they're listening Go to uh, uh, go on Amazon. Secrets and shame, dear Oprah diaries by Dr. James Mercer. Please, James and a portion of those proceeds are going to help our foster children and help you know find them a forever home. So you're doing, you're killing two birds with one stone and doing a fabulous job. And it's an incredible it. read, and I'm so proud because my copy that I have my hardbound copy because I wrote I got it from right. Amazon. I have it signed by Dr. Mercer. Absolutely, and I'm going to cherish this one custom, of a kind, buddy. custom. And so, will you come back again? Will you come Listen, back? Listen, I don't want to leave. I know. Isn't it great here in I have California? I to be in Arizona tomorrow for taping in the morning, and I, I'm trying to find every excuse to come back quick. Well, we're going to meet up in Sedona because I've never been there, and Nita has a tricked-out house from what I hear in Sedona. <laughs> and so we are going to meet in Sedona. So, James, thank you so much. Well, listen, thank you and Madonna both, your wife Madonna. She invited me to stay for a several several weeks. So, ahead, stay. It's a party at our house. <laughs> I'm coming. And you get to see Tony and, and, uh, and Paul again, and maybe. Paul Diaz, <laughs> and Paul yes. Diaz again. <laughs> so that's it again. Secrets of Chain, the Dear Oprah Diaries. And until next time, this is John Marchese with Choice TV Radio signing off. You've been listening, as always, to Choice TV Radio. The most fascinating conversations you'll find anywhere around. The only question you have to answer is, is it radio or is it TV? Heck, it's both. With your host, John Marchese, award-winning executive producer and owner of Choice TV.